give me a second. Okay. Hey, you guys, when you're all done, the power cords and extension cords that aren't yours, could you pick them all up and bring them down and put them on this table, please? Thank you. Um, hey, guys, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm an ex systems engineer. Uh, so many years ago, I was uh, quite active in the port tree as uh, any good uh, systems, free BSD systems engineer is. But uh, yeah, life happened, and uh, uh, I, I kind of, uh, as time passed by, I got into a very uh, interesting situation of uh, being the sole systems engineer on a sort of large scale project, uh, but having like a zillion of other tasks along with it, and uh, having just like five to 10% of my time dedicated to, uh, to the, the sort of tasks I'm used to doing, uh, or was used to doing. Uh, and uh, that's on one hand, a very unfortunate position, like you, uh, whatever, whatever you know to do best, uh, designing systems, architecting, uh, making ports, packages, all that stuff, uh, you just uh, have very kind of small portion of your time to do that now. But on the other hand, you, uh, you don't have any uh, excuse to, to do uh, routine stuff, to waste your time, to um, uh, to do stuff that can be automated. So uh, when you're forced, when you really have uh, little time, when you're, forced, uh, when, when you're forced to do stuff efficiently, really forced, then uh, I find myself in a very fortunate situation of uh, being forced to come up with efficient solutions. So this story starts like many others. It's uh, uh, currently a medium-sized company. Uh, we have a kind of moderately sized private cloud, which uh, uh, is tasks, uh, tasked with a, a, a large assortment of uh, uh, tasks associated with me online media services. So ingesting content, processing, streaming large amounts of it, uh, currently most of the uh, computing power is spent on, uh, uh, on a music service. So that's uh, ingesting, copying, encoding, extracting audio features, uh, and then of course streaming to lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of clients. So it's, uh, it's by no means anywhere near uh, the sort of scale Yahoo or Facebook or any uh, that kind of company uh, companies are, but it's it's a fair amount of processing. It's currently petabytes of storage, uh, almost a hundred gigabit uh, of aggregate transfer capacity, and uh, teraflops of processing. Uh, so to give you just just a bit more stats, uh, it grew uh, it grew to four countries now: Western Europe, Eastern Europe, North America. Uh, 10 cities, uh, more than 10 data centers. We have to deal with, uh, with a number of very different service providers, uh, different support contracts, SLA levels, uh, ranging from uh, very, uh, very agile and hands-on support to no support at all. And still, it's, it's just uh, uh, around 100 machines. So. Uh, they're fairly powerful. Uh, many of them carry a lot of storage attached to them. Uh, it's uh, about 20 really distinct hardware configurations uh, and just about 100 of uh, mostly large capacity hard drives. So that's where all the peta petabytes of data uh, are located. Uh, yeah, it, it boils down to uh, several dozen local networks, uh, different network types, depending on the service provider, whether we own it or not. Uh, seven, about seven types of out-of-band uh, consoles. Currently, one operating system, I can, uh, you know, I'm sure you can guess it, but 
the sort of uh, the sort of task we de we're dealing with is uh, will probably warrant potentially more operating systems, uh, but still it's currently about five boot types. So it's uh, local hard drive, local USB flash, uh, network, several types of network uh, boot types, uh, and uh, this is uh, this is what really. Uh, forces us to do stuff efficiently. There's just one systems engineer, one network engineer, who of course is 90% in uh, networking tasks, and one field engineer. Uh, so initially, when we just uh, were starting, uh, we, we sort of solved all the problems the usual, uh, the usual way. So the uh, machines we owned, uh, that were nicely collocated in just one data center were uh, I made we basically made a cluster out of them. It was initially uh, network booted with NFS root and uh, well thanks to uh, the work of Brooks Davis and many others it works quite nicely right of the, out of the box you don't have to, to uh, do a lot and uh, notice that note that the shared root configuration where anything you edit on any uh, box is immediately shared with uh, all other boxes worked really nice. So that, uh, that setup uh, is, was, was kind of very well working for us, not, not uh, demanding too much attention. As for the least service, we uh, went with the usual route of uh, set up once and kind of forget for at least for some time because it becomes uh, increasingly difficult to uh, to update everything in time to uh, change configuration unless you employ some kind of uh, external automation. So when uh, things started scaling, we briefly considered uh, Puppet and uh, other configuration management systems like it. Uh, I kind of tried to deal with them before that, but uh, they always seemed like uh, may maybe to, to a guy who didn't really uh, spend a lot of time with them, they, they almost seemed like an unnecessary level of complexity. So uh, there was also uh, kind of the, uh, the usual way of uh, using a lot of in-house scripts to do, uh, to generate basically all the configuration files and everything else uh, with custom-made scripts and deliver them to all the machines, but obviously that uh, well, if if uh, if that route is con to be considered seriously, you better go with a standardized solution like Puppet. So uh, priorities were quite obvious. We uh, we were scarce on manpower, and uh, we still needed extremely high. Uh, reliability and performance higher than a lot of uh, a lot of out of the box ready made solutions uh, provided so of course uh, like if you want to store a few petabytes of data you can just purchase a solution from NetApp or Isilon uh, Isilon uh, and the, that would solve a lot of management prob uh, problems so we uh, well I personally dealt with NetApp appliances and they are are really easy to, to deal with. Um, but, for example, we, we needed streaming, processing, and storage. So NetApp gives you just storage. Isilon gives you uh, storage and streaming, but no processing. And when we started, we wanted to be cost effective. That's not so critical now, but uh, we wanted to be cost effective and slip streaming all these uh, three major tasks into one custom FreeBSD-based solution seemed very logical at the time, and uh, in hindsight, it still uh, looks that way. So there was a period of uh, of agony. So we had we had to maintain configuration, to deploy a lot of, to start deploying more and more boxes in different locations, different networking setups, different, different SLA types, whatever, KVM types. Uh, so there, there was that, 
and we, we needed to scale internal processing. So a lot of different factors, and there, there needed to be one answer to all of that. So how can we, uh, is there a solution, cost or more existing, to ease everything at once? And so I talked to a lot of systems engineers, very, uh, very seasoned, very experienced, and uh, when you lay out the whole range of problems and uh, look for one single answer to, uh, well, in part, to all of them, then most of them look at you and say, well, are you an idiot? So there's a solution to that, there's a solution to that, and so you, you need Puppet, you need uh, Enterprise or open source, uh, well, wh whatever, out-of-band management solution you need, uh, kind of this solution for deployments, uh, you know, well, in fact, FreeBSD doesn't do well with automated deployments as much as uh, these and these Linuxes. Uh, and so uh, the, the agony was, is there a, an answer to that? And I believe we kind of found our own, uh, well, maybe my personal holy grail, and uh, it boils down to just uh, just a few simple uh, just a few simple methodologies, a very simple ideology. So, if uh, some of you are expecting rocket science or a lot of buzzwords, I'm afraid you will be disappointed. There's very little code, very little, uh, actually very little stuff to talk about, but a few simple uh, methods of doing stuff. So I call it unified, unified configuration management and unified deployment, and it's basically the same thing. And so I'll go, I'll just describe the current status as opposed to the long road that led to it. So what's unified? It's uh, when you have exactly the same root file system uh, and basically all the configuration everywhere. Uh, this, this kind of, it, it sounds difficult, to, to do in production, but then again, looking back at the NFS, uh, common root NFS based setup, uh, where it w works really nicely, that, see, uh, that ceases to be fantastical. So uh, it, it, requires, uh, it requires a bit of sorcery. So we decided to go with Git, uh, and currently there are there's one main uh, uh, Git repository covering the whole root file system. Uh, there's some custom, custom scripts that are kept elsewhere under USR local uh, project name, .git. And uh, uh, actually, every, uh, every home directory, every user, that, uh, every administrator or external user that wishes that his uh, home directory um, is distributed through the whole private cloud, needs to convert it to Git. Uh, and from there, it's uh, really, uh, when you achieve that, uh, then it, it really becomes a, uh, a straightforward solution, a straightforward, fully distributed solution. Uh, Git is really one of the nicest tools to do a true master-master sync. Yes, it's manual, but that gives you unparalleled flexibility. Um, it has very powerful conflict resolution, and when you think about, think about it, uh, when you think about uh, if any of you had experiences with OpenLDAP or any enterprise solutions, which kind of do master-master, but you, you have to spend a lot of time setting them up, and when something goes wrong, you'll spend, uh, uh, well, sleepless nights debugging it, uh, then uh, Git and uh, well, Git-based file system-based uh, uh, registry of configuration doesn't seem like uh, like a crazy solution, and uh, we we didn't deploy any symlinking or copying uh, file copying solution based on uh, based on Git. A lot of people are using those. Uh, like you keep uh, your uh, Git-based uh, checkout or a subversion-based checkout somewhere, uh, somewhere to the side, and symlink to that, so that you know the, well, uh, so that it's it's kind of more, it seems more orderly. 
But when all you have to do in Git really is disable show on tracked files, and then uh, you, you can really kind of keep, keep the uh, Git checkout uh, in the production live di directory. Uh, so what they, what they gave us is really when, when we slipstreamed uh, dozens or yeah, dozens of different, very different configuration types, uh, different, different types of rc.conf files, different types of all configurations of all the services we employ, HTTP and everything else, slipstream that into a single repository, single repo, single, single branch. That really concentrated all the uh, complexity in a single place. And so instead of when you want to, when you want to uh, find out what kind of you know, uh, how that machine differs from this one. You don't have to log in uh, to do two different machines or look up, check out two different branches, two different repositories. You just look at a single uh, piece of conf configuration and depending on how exactly it's done, you either see it all in a, in a single file or in two files uh, lying just next to each other. Mm. So, but, but of course the question is, if you have uh, hundreds of thousands of machines, a lot of different roles assigned to each of them, so it's not an, a, a big uh, HPC cluster uh, where everyone is sort of doing the same job. Uh, it's, it's really a, a private cloud production setup, so depending on location, uh, con hardware configuration, you have uh, boxes dedicated to ingestion, uh, dedicated to processing, <coughs> streaming, or log collection. So how do we keep it all, uh, how do we keep the roles uh, in one place without infringing on each other? Uh, so, well, first things uh, first, I, I thought how to store roles. Uh, role is a very simple concept, it, it's used, well, it's basically in Unix, the uh, synonym is group. Uh, so in, in Postgres, uh, we have roles. In, in uh, Solaris, there's a separate concept of roles. Uh, it's a very widespread concept. And so I needed, uh, I needed it not just for users, but for machines. And I thought about, you know, implementing a, just, just keeping it in a separate file, mapping host names to roles. Uh, uh, or that, but then it struck me that, uh, I, well, at our scale, uh, hundreds, thousands, and maybe tens of, uh, and even maybe hundreds of thousands machines, we could really use password, just password and group files, uh, the standard user Unix uh, infrastructure for users and groups, and that worked really nicely. So you you just place every host name there, uh, every host name is assigned. Uh, an, an eponymous uh, group, and uh, then you have groups of, uh, of hosts signifying their roles. So uh, web server hosts would be assigned to the group named uh, whatever, web host. Uh, just one, one file that, uh, that is kind of separate and needed for machines to learn who they are when they're booting up is uh, called aware map a map of awareness. Because at boot, when you have, when each machine has exactly the same root, you have to ask yourself, how does it know what host name to attach to itself? What IP address, if it's not DHCP booted or DHCP enabled network, what IP address to assign to itself? And so we decided to go with just one map, or just one file that ties host names or uh, which is the same as role names, because every host has uh, a unique role apart from all others assigned to it. Uh, role names uh, tied to one or more MAC addresses. So when you boot, you, just, you wonder, who am I? Uh, and you look for, for your MAC, uh, and when you find it, you just, well, basically grab a wear map or uh, just look into a wear map, and you instantly know which host you, you are, which basic role you have, and all the other roles uh, you get from etc group, um, 
and all the other files, configuration files. So how do we get away with having, for example, one rc.conf uh, on a hundred of very differently tasks, tasked uh, uh, boxes? So with rc.conf, it's really a breeze because it's basically a shell script. So uh, I call the, the type of uh, conf configuration files that are very easy to, uh, to convert to role-aware setup one config file for uh, 100 differently tasked boxes. I call them role-aware. Uh, so it's a shell script. You, the, the, the only problem is that you, you need to know how it's evaluated. But because it's not just sourced one time, you have to uh, really understand, uh, uh, especially at boot, how exactly it is sourced and what happens there. But when you do that, that boils down to uh, to a solution somewhat like this. So uh, there's a common part, and uh, obviously 80 or 90 percent of configuration, uh, well, uh, depending, on, depending on the setup, is common to all boxes. So you basically want NTPD and some other parameters on every one of your boxes. But then comes the interesting part. When you want your web service uh, to have a specific parameter enabled, uh, what uh, what we currently do is in rc.conf is just define a function with uh, name role dot role name and place uh, anything specific you want the, there. So if you want a specific hack to be enabled on just one host, you can do that too. And just at the end of uh, rc.conf, well, you can actually do that not just in rc.conf but anywhere else where. Uh, where you know uh, that it would be sourced just after rc.conf, we do just this. So for, for each of your role, you, you look for a function named like that, and if it exists, you, exists, you just execute it. So that's kind of <coughs> the flux capacitor, the kind of uh, the, all the uh, complicated code that went into enabling this kind of setup. Uh, NGINX-CONF is not, uh, uh, for example, I, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, ever used NGINX, but it's sort of, uh, the configuration syntax is sort of reminiscent uh, of uh, HTTPD and uh, LightTPD and other web servers. So it's not role aware in that you can't do really crazy stuff uh, within it. You can't, uh, from within the single config file, you can't really ask uh, yourself, if I'm that host, do that. But who, what you can do is define uh, all the servers, all the types of servers you need. Uh, just put it in one file and use the effect, uh, use the fact that uh, on each of the on if each of your hosts, only the relevant parts of your configuration file will be invoked, needed for that. Uh, well, actually, uh, another example that I didn't put on my in my slides is uh, the new uh, the new uh, HasD daemon, uh, the high availability storage daemon. Uh, what I like about it is uh, that it, it its configuration system uh, configuration syntax is uh, specifically supports uh, multi-host configuration. So if you ever tried setting up HasD and you know that you can put a uh, configuration of uh, two or more of, of your host, uh, hosts in one file, and they will be invoked. Uh, each part of the configuration file will be invoked uh, exactly where, where it's needed. Uh, most configuration files, though, are problematic. For example, syslog.conf is uh, something I call role unaware. It's very difficult if you're using, especially if you're using the stock syslog uh, daemon, it's very difficult to use a single configuration files across the whole infrastructure, especially if you, <coughs> if you have a, a dedicated uh, log collection server. So, so what, we, what we do is just, uh, in this case, uh, yes, keep, keep two configuration files one is uh, common to most nodes, which just send most configure all or most uh, 
uh, log messages to uh, the log collector. And on log collect for log collector, we have uh, a second file. They, both of them are kept in the same Git repository. So you can always look for that. And we have uh, rcconf-based workaround. So uh, for, for all the boxes, by default, uh, syslog.conf is used. But if, if the machine is assigned the role named log collection or whatever, then we just have, in rc.conf, we just uh, assign a different uh, configuration file to that. I'm not sure if, if uh, I got this, the, the flag here right, but I just wrote from memory. Uh, the hard case is fstab. So uh, obviously, with uh, fstab is needed at boot. So you can't do rcconf-based workaround. Uh, and what we settled on is just keep it empty. Just keep it empty, and uh, uh, we use, we basically specify where to load, where to boot from in uh, loader.conf. Uh, you, can, you can obviously use, uh, you can obviously use uh, the uh, loader parameter named uh, VFS mount root from, or something like that. Uh, and uh, what we discovered while doing that is that, well, we, we have, uh, what's, what's interesting about the setup is that machines don't care if they boot it from network or locally. Uh, if you keep the configuration files moderately in sync, they, they just don't care. So what we have is when new machines arrive or when uh, a boot drive on any one of them goes, uh, goes toast, then they just start in booting from network. Uh, and if you, what we discovered, if you have uh, that parameter in, uh, in loader.conf uh, that says boot from local hard drive, if it doesn't find that local hard drive, then it just, uh, and is booted from network, from NFS, then it just ignores the line. So it's kind of a very useful fallback. So if you're booting from, uh, from NFS, then if, if the local hard drive is present, then you'll mount root from it. If it's not, then you, you don't. Uh, for all the other partitions but, but the root one, we, we just use a single script that does a very simple thing, sort of looks for what's, what's available and uh, just mounts it uh, where, where needed. So uh, yeah, here we come to actually how, how to do deployment efficiently. Mm. And uh, it's, uh, in, in most cases, it's not a problem. Uh, when you have like a single type of infrastructure, just, just rented boxes or just NFS booted boxes or just anything, it's, it's not a big problem. But when you have like a lot of different scenarios at once, you have to come up with something uh, uh, kind of different. And uh, so uh, what, what I wanted to do is f to find some kind of setup that kind of mimics, uh, mimics what appliances do. Uh, like all the, well, our beloved Juniper devices, NetApp, uh, all the other FreeBSD and Linux and the custom OS-based appliances. They're very straightforward in that you load some kind of single image into them and uh, they just work. You have to tweak configuration, but they just work. If you want to upgrade, you sort of just load a new configuration, a, a new image, and uh, they just continue to work. You reboot, they just work. Uh, so uh, what, I, what I came to uh, is we, we don't do embedded. So all, all machines basically have, uh, well, s at least several tens of gigabytes of space. Uh, so it, it got down to an image the size of uh, an image the size of uh, two 10 gigabyte uh, partition and one four gigabyte swap partition. So what you do is actually uh, find a, a drive that's suitable for booting, whether it's flash, USB flash, or SSD or HDD, and you partition that uh, that drive using we use GPT for that. You partition that, uh, that drive in at least three partitions. Two of them is for root. Uh, well, two basically for redundancy and upgrades. Uh, one of them goes to swap, and uh, 
uh, anything that's left on the drive, it might be a four terabyte drive, goes uh, just, uh, is partitioned into UFS2, and we use the schema like dev UFS and serial number of the hard drive. Uh, so, yeah, that's loader conf. Uh, in loader conf, you just specify basically dev UFS root, and then if you boot it from NFS and your host is not does not have that partition uh, at the at the moment of boot, it just it just falls back to NFS root. If it does find that partition, it mounts. If you not boot it from NFS, then you probably have that root partition, and it's it's all uh, very good. That's how we keep loader conf, the, a single loader conf uh, across the whole infrastructure, both NFS booted part of it and uh, locally booted part of it. Uh, so if you, if you get a, a new box, a sort of uh, hardware adjustment, all you have to do is, uh, is adjust a wear map for getting, assigning MAC addresses to, uh, to hosts. Uh, you, you place uh, the new, uh, the new hosts into your password and group files, assign whatever roles you need them to be, uh, adjust your DHCP and uh, your, basically your network, networking infrastructure, whatever, uh, DNS, and then uh, you just, uh, well, while on the, on the new box, uh, however you got to it, whether it's MFS, uh, MFS BSD based a uh, rescue environment on Hetzna, or your, your, your self, uh, self-made, custom, custom-made NFS boot environment. Uh, when you're in that box, you just find a suitable hard drive, partition it according to the script. It's just uh, five lines of, of a shell script. And uh, uh, you uh, untore a recent image from any other box. You untore a recent image of a root partition into it. So you just, uh, well, you, you can use SSH for that, uh, SSH, and, well, if you have a TAR uh, archive ready, then you just uh, cat it via SSH and untar it live. Or, well, if rsync did, uh, uh, did extended attributes and all the other stuff nicely, then uh, you would probably use that. But it's, it's extremely straightforward. So when you have it deployed, then uh, there comes a question of upgrades. So we have three levels of up upgrades. The most dis disruptive one is full upgrade. It's not completely uh, finished at the moment. So the idea is just, uh, you, well, you have a current, currently mounted root drive, just untar the new, the com a complete new image to the second one, and uh, then you pivot. You assign, you change uh, UFS labels on these drives, or well, maybe do it in a other way. But changing UFS labels uh, work nicely for us. So I'm just not sure what happens, uh, uh, what where the kernel would be taken from. Uh, but it's just it's it's uh, for us it's uh, kind of. Uh, a bit of an incomplete setup, but mostly it works. At least user land will, uh, will always be fresh this way. Uh, so we obviously there's a, there's a desire to use rsync uh, or, well, maybe package-ng if we come to a point where our base system is uh, sort of representable, representable in packages, in form of packages. Or maybe uh, a custom, you know, uh, on-site uh, FreeBSD update server, something like that. But for now, uh, well, actually, it's not it's not 24 gigabytes of information. The uh, the image is just about 2.5 gigabytes, and when compressed, it's like 700 megabytes. So if you have like a 100 megabit connection, then <laughs> Then it's really easy to uh, load it, uh, load it fully, untor it fully each time. Uh, there's uh, the second level, less disruptive level of upgrade is package upgrade. Obviously, where you upgrade all the packages you use, and that's fairly straightforward thanks to package ng. We don't have to keep uh, ports uh, 
on, on any of the boxes or compile anything of them. Everything is done just once, all the compilation. And uh, what you can do is uh, dynamically assign any box to, to ports building. So you just check out your cell ports, build ports, and then you, have, you basically have the new image and the new package repository. So the environment is really, it was our focus to make it fully distributed. So, well, obviously it's, it's never perfect, but mostly it is. It is uh, fully distributed. And then the least disruptive way to uh, upgrade and uh, w the, the one that goes on continuously is just git pool of the uh, root partition, the custom scripts and home directories. Uh, that's, that's now done, uh, uh, may, well, semi-automatically, uh, but it can be, I, I believe it can be automated, just, you know, uh, very close to real time. So that would constitute uh, a very nice, well, low data, but very consistent, very reliable distributed file system, if you, uh, if you allow <coughs> me to call it that. So when you have all that, you edit any configuration file on any of your boxes, wherever you're comfortable logging in, whichever box is closest to your current location, just log in, edit, commit, and push. And uh, you, you don't need to think about, you know, any centralized uh, template-based puppet setup. You just, you work with your, uh, with your end configuration files, with your current configuration files. You don't need to think how, uh, how, how, they, be, uh, how they will be generated and stuff. You just uh, edit and commit and push, and they applied verbatim to all your uh, other boxes. And uh, if you have a conflict situation, obviously Git has very powerful instrumentation to resolve that. Uh, so uh, having the benefit of uh, having the whole system uh, almost perfectly distributed, uh, you uh, kind of experience a very, you kind of have a very scalable solution where it doesn't really matter. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that scaling to up to uh, tens of hundreds of thousands of, of boxes will be pretty seamless because you, all you have to do is to tweak how uh, basically the, the Git-based configuration files will be distributed. You don't need to do it from, from a centralized place. You just uh, you know, make a hierarchical or maybe a random, uh, randomly uh, uh, a distributed infrastructure, like you know, check your check your neighbors and uh, transfer to them uh, or from them if they're newer sort of. Uh, and it's 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 also scalable in terms of human resources. So uh, we just we we have very few people. We would be glad to hire a few dozen more, even even today. But uh, while we limited. We're confident that it's, it's scalable even now because uh, the load on operations is really low at the moment. It's mostly, uh, mostly non-routing stuff. So a sort of new type of problem. Yeah, you have to accommodate it in, in custom scripts or whatever. A new type of hardware. Yeah, you have to think about that and accommodate that. But routing problems are really... Uh, really, uh, well, at that point started demanding uh, several orders of magnitude less of our attention. You don't have this, like, hundreds of different configuration files. You just have everything at one, in one place. The, but there are, uh, there are problems, of course. So one of them is Git, Git is really uh, kind of beautiful uh, until you really know its guts. So when you really start working with it, leveraging its uh, kind of obscure parts of it, its functionality, uh, and, well, you, you start hating it. And it's also not really uh, designed to support uh, file, system, file system versioning. It's, it is designed for code versioning. It would be trivial to add, like, permissions and... Uh, uh, and file mode to that, but obviously whoever is behind current Git development 
is really uh, against that, well, that might be understandable, but I think it should be really reinvented. It's a very nice master-master synchronization, fully distributed solution. Uh, it opened up, it, in many res uh, respects, Git opened uh, the eyes of many developers and uh, systems engineers to how, uh, how things could be done. But uh, it now, with that experience, it can be reinvented, I think, from scratch uh, to a very, uh, to really a better solution. Async is obviously does not support many of FreeBSD specific and basically any specific features. It's just a uh, universal tool. And we would be liking, uh, we would be using it much more if it had better support for all the attributes and other file system specific stuff. Uh, and the, 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 I think the most important problem is, uh, I would say, any daemon author, any application author should start thinking that his application is not, uh, will not be run on a single machine. If it's a, a good, if it's a good one, uh, then people will, will use it in companies where they don't have just one box. Because companies, for, for really simple tasks, one box is not enough. Ten boxes are not enough these days. You usually have, in, for moderate tasks, you have to have dozens or hundreds of boxes, at least starting from that. And so if you, if you design your software to, with that in mind, then you have to think about, uh, well, how will that poor, uh, that poor guy with systems engineer badge will be managing your, the configuration of your daemon or whatever. And to, just to accommodate, uh, to accommodate sort of role aware uh, stuff into your configuration parser. Sort of like uh, Powell d did with HasD, where you, from, from the start he knew that HasD cannot be run on, on a single uh, machine. It's storage synchronization daemon. It doesn't make sense to run it on a single machine. So if it's run on several machines, why don't we uh, have the opportunity to keep all the, the configuration of all the machines in one configuration file? That sort of stuff is really, uh, that sort of mindset is really something that uh, I think many, uh, so, well, software authors should awaken to. Um, uh, so st still the, uh, the result, I think, is pretty simple. There's no, as I promised, no rocket science. Just, just a couple of very simple tricks and, uh, well, a couple of obscure, uh, obscure issues that you just need to stumble upon once and learn them. Uh, but it's pretty foolproof. Uh, you, can, uh, you can have, uh, well, you, you can recover really easily whatever you do. Uh, you have everything in, in one place, so you don't have weird uh, uh, out-of-sync issues. And uh, you, you can have different, uh, different versions of your Git repository on different machines. Uh, in fact, I, I do think it's, it's useful to, you know, to have slightly different versions of configurations, uh, unless that's security related. To, to just have, uh, uh, you know, when you scale, then uh, uh, your programs, your machines will crash. And when you have the data of, you know, this configuration crashes machines more often than this one, uh, whether it's rc.conf or a, a particular kernel configuration or kernel version, then it really helps. Uh, it, it helps more than when, when you have just one single configuration across the whole infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I think uh, that's about it. So if you have questions, shoot. If you don't have questions, for those of you who manages a lot of machines and thinks that most of this, uh, what we're doing is pretty uh, nonsensical, then I'll, I'll just, I really, uh, I'd like to hear that from you and may, maybe uh, have a chance to respond to that. Yeah, 
So uh, the, the problem with NFS is that we got from a single data center to, uh, to a lot of them. And uh, well, you can't keep uh, a single NFS uh, root in the center because uh, NFS is very sensitive to latency. So even like 20, kilom 20 kilometers really messes things up. But when we got to 700 kilometers, Obviously, you can have NFS roots everywhere, but then that's a layer of complexity. But, well, NFS, basically, it works uh, really nicely. I just wanted to uh, a single solution that also works for our rented hosts uh, that, that we don't have an opportunity to boot from NFS. And the, the only way I could do that is come up with a local kind of boot solution, which is compatible with NFS. Uh, another thing with NFS is it's really unstable. Uh, uh, NFS routes work nicely, but when you saturate your network uplink, obviously you have problems. Uh, when you basically when you do a lot of access to NFS uh, uh, file systems, your system might become become unresponsive. Placing Union on top of that, I think it would only exacerbate issues. So. Yeah, but it's it's a nice solution. Yeah. Do you do anything to try to uh, when you say you make a change from one host that spreads out to everything else? That basically means that one host should compromise all servers. Yeah, security. Yeah, I this kind of my approach to security is uh, if you if you don't have <coughs> your infrastructure doing anything useful efficiently, then there's no security to speak about. So uh, this whole thing is kind of just getting, getting it to doing something usefully while you don't have to uh, work 24 hours on it. From there, I'm, uh, I'm currently just starting to look, look into security. I don't think it should be, it should be put before functionality. Well, when you when you don't have any functionality, but but yes, it it could actually. Uh, cloud security is really kind of messed up topic. When you kind of have to have machines accessing data and functions on other machines without you being involved into that interactively. It's so, not an easy problem, and, and I'm not saying. I agree that I mean, especially with the resource the constraints that you don't have any more people to do with it. Yeah, but we're, we're working on that. I have some ideas maybe for next uh, BSD CAN. Yeah. Well, there are some working proposals that allows you to do signing of things. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Why? Why? I, I would at that point. I'm, I'm obviously not familiar with that kind of scale. But at that point, I would ask why the configuration has to change so often. Right, maybe. So in our example, like, uh, just in a very broad term, we handle a lot of email from a lot of people. Um, so something on a scale of like uh, ten million domains, we have like Right. Right. Yeah, I would just separate uh, the really dynamic, uh, high volume stuff into something, well, something so separate. Like we, we have an approach where we do more role-based applications. Yeah. Rather than okay, yeah. role understand. Cool. The replication cool, yeah, cool. That, yeah, that solves it. Nice. Uh, yeah? Can you talk a little bit more about how you manage the configuration for, like, Nginx? Well, yeah, it's just uh, we, we had like we had like three different 
rows or, well, three different web servers with different configuration files. Each of them had sections of, ser well, with server name, server name one, server name two, server name three. And then when, when we wanted to convert it to a cloud, uh, well, sort of single configuration files, we just put, uh, put those sections into one configuration file and then put it on each box. So in each box, only the section that matters to it is really invoked. Uh, for in many cases, we may even manage to, uh, to, well, to condense it even further. So some, uh, well, some server roles got, you know, uh, merged. So, but, uh, huh? Did, did well, it work? We have some of the configuration more specific. Yeah, well, actually, we, we do have uh, also the, the problem with SSL, SSL keys. Uh, some box have, uh, have them, some box don't. So obviously, yeah, in that case, we also use the, the rc.conf workaround where we have Engi yeah, nginx conf wrappers, which just include other Engi nginx sub configuration files. Uh, and that solves it. We don't have, it's, it's a bit of a, yeah, it's, it's not that nice, but it, it, it works quite simply. So, yeah. Well, yes, it's currently quite a kind of natal state where it's semi-automatic, and that uh, I basically have have a command that uh, invokes. Uh, it, well, it's just it's just uh, on the order of hundreds of machines. I have a command that invokes. Uh, 100 SSH commands on, on all the machines if I want them all updated. Uh, so it's, it's in part, in that part, it's, it's currently manual. What I'm working on is uh, in relation to, security, to the, the security topic is uh, kind of a way for machines to talk to each other securely where each, well, each machine has its own host account so I want to leverage that into kind of secure, secure remote procedure calls, but it's not fully automated yet. So uh, I think uh, I think that's pretty. Uh, what, what doesn't scale? I mean, the simultaneous. Every host has a user account. Each only has five thousand user accounts. No, you we can. Why? Don't we? No, we, we, the, uh, the that's not the limit. It's 32 bits, I think, currently, or 64 even. You might have other scaling problems when going to that size. But yeah. And uh, there's a nice hash, hash in them. But obviously, that's just a, 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 a way to do it simply without writing anything custom when you don't have time to. We don't. We don't detect. We don't have compromised hosts, at least. Yeah, obviously we do. I mean, everyone does uh, have compromise. You... Yeah. Okay. So, do do you have compromised hosts? Yeah. So you see. Okay. So, do you have compromised hosts that you don't detect? Yeah. Okay. So, obviously we we probably do too. No, we don't. We don't. Well, yeah. Well, we'll deal deal with security later. But well, <laughs> actually, it would be rather easy to detect if somebody's submitting something into it because I assume somewhere on a workstation there would be a copy, and when you do a pull, you can see this, the history. So yeah. And you can use Git or like a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's perfect, but you won't be able it's to easier check. for somebody to to do that if they have it because you've got this local repository and it may go on this for longer. Whereas if you've got something like well, yeah, but actually, I agree. 
Well, it's, it's easier for, it would be easier for you and me. I mean, you know, we, we just log in and push. But for people who really break into boxes, I think it doesn't matter for them if you use well, Git or... You know, every, every couple of minutes you just have a cron job doing git reset ed, and poof, changes magically disappear. Yeah. But then you can't make that change without... Well, if you really... I, yeah. I think well, it's important to to think about security as a well as a as a kind of important but a kind of an issue that doesn't need to get in your way before you have something useful. Uh, because if you start with security, then you better not touch computers at all. Yeah, I don't, don't deny that. But how does it conflict? I mean, I don't, I don't require having the opportunity to edit anything anywhere. I just, uh, it's, it's a current feature that you can disable. And then you just have, like, you, you can use, I guess you can use FreeBSD updates instead of uh, TAR and SSH. You, well, we use PackageNG instead of Portmaster, which is also a PackageNG standard solution. And we just, uh, we just I just didn't, uh, didn't want Safe engine or puppet because uh, you can uh, you can really do very sim well very well without them. <coughs> it, yeah, if you don't need if you don't need that security compromise uh, situation where you can push anywhere from anywhere, you just disable it. Uh, I, I don't know. I would be worried about reinventing if I really had something complicated. At the moment, there's like five lines of code and uh, okay, I'm fine if I reinvented something with them. It's just so simple that I don't care. If I piled up Ruby, Python, whatever scripts in thousands of lines, then yeah, I would be worried. Did I waste my, a month of my time doing that? But currently it's too simple to worry about that, I think. Yeah. to see is uh, like operating systems incorporating at least part of those solutions so that well actually reinventing the wheel is what bothers me uh, well personally as I see every company every uh, every setup reinventing it whether using puppet or not they still have a lot of custom stuff and sort of pushing some of that back to the operating system where I think it's supposed to be because of, well the operating system is, a, is not a kernel, it's, it's a, a repository of shared effort, something like that. So it would be nice. So roll away configuration files would be nice, or maybe something completely else that just makes uh, all, all your solutions easier. Um, anything else? I think it is the final session. And... Uh.
and uh, see you all around. Thanks for coming.